Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Suspense. The adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Dragnet. And now, Gangbusters. Welcome to the Film Detective Podcast, where we bring you theater of the mind programming from the golden age of radio. I'm your host, Carl Amari. This time, Frank Lovejoy stars as Chicago newspaper man Randy Stone on Night Beat from 1952. Stick around. We'll be right back. Frank Lovejoy starred as Randy Stone, a war hero and streetwise journalist who combed Chicago's windy streets after office hours during the Night Beat in search of human interest stories. A prolific newspaper columnist for the Chicago Star, Randy was a hard-boiled yet kind-hearted character, and his lasonic style came in handy when talking bad guys out of doing vile deeds. Airing from 1950 until 1952, NBC referred to the program as a dramatic thriller, but that wasn't completely accurate, and Night Beat seemed to defy classification. It wasn't really a detective series, and there was no sidekick, little violence, and no bullying newspaper editors screaming on the phone about deadlines. Focusing on the psychology of the characters and their motivation, the series was cerebral in nature. The dialogue was rhythmic and hypnotic, and the critics raved. Less than a year after the radio program went off the air, Frank Lovejoy reprised his role as Randy Stone for a would-be pilot television episode on Four Star Playhouse. The gritty, tough guy dialogue of the radio scripts was better suited to the airwaves, and the pilot never went beyond the initial airing. In this episode, Randy Stone receives a tip that a bomb has been planted on a DC-4 airliner en route to Denver. Here's The Bomb on Flight 63, starring Frank Lovejoy on Night Beat from September 4th, 1952. NBC presents Transcribed. Frank Lovejoy in Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the Night Beat for the Chicago Star. In a newspaper office, the night seems especially reserved for all sorts of screwy crank calls. And if every wild tale that came in over the telephone was tracked down, there wouldn't be enough reporters left around to make up a game of solitaire. This yarn started with one of those calls, but it ended differently. And how differently it ended. It was 8 o'clock in the evening. A heavy rain was falling, and I found an excuse to sit it out by polishing my next day's monumental trivia for the column. I was looking for the capital A on my typewriter when the phone rang. Stone talking. Mr. Stone, please listen. I'm listening. A bomb in the plane to Denver. A what? In the Denver bomb plane tonight. A bomb. Don't you understand? What's your name? You have no time. The passengers... If you're on the level, you give me your name. No, my husband... I've got to go now. My bus is leaving. You're in a bus depot. Which one? Mr. Stone, you're wasting time. It's true, I tell you. The Denver plane. Well, what time does the flight leave? 8.30. I, I couldn't call till now. You say 8.30? Yes. Oh, please. Well, lady, you phoned exactly 10 minutes too late. 20 minutes to 9 right now. Oh, no. No. <laughs> I repeat, some nights are good for a dozen crank calls, but I couldn't take chances with this one. I called the control tower at the airport. Control? Uh, This is Randy Stone, Chicago Star. Yes, Mr. Stone. You had an 8.30 flight to Denver? Yes, sir, but that... Oh, well, you better contact that pilot immediately and tell him to make an emergency landing wherever he is. Have him load the passengers and let no one near the plane till the police get there. But the Denver plane hasn't taken off. Fog came in suddenly and the flight has been grounded till it lifts. Where is she now? Far into the strip. Oh, good. Well, keep her there and warn all personnel to keep clear, and I'll be out there as soon as I can. Listen, Stone, you No, you do as I say. I phoned police headquarters, and they sent a radio car to pick me up. In five minutes, I was sitting in the back seat with Sergeant Skalski while the driver ripped up the streets at 70 miles an hour. 
if there's anything I can't stand, Randy, it's bombs. How what time you got, Sergeant? Eh, uh, 8.55. And me off duty 20 minutes ago. I was getting a ride home when the call came through. Oh, there she is. You can stop here. Okay. Come on. Uh, uh, I don't mind telling you, Randy, I'm scared. Yeah, me too. I hope that call was a phony. It was a bomb, all right, and a big one. The explosion threw me to the ground. When the earth stopped tossing me around, I looked at the burning DC-4, and people were pouring towards her out of the main building. I saw a jeep with a fire crew race for the plane, and I fought my way back to my feet. Uh, you hurt Randy? I'm shaken up, that's all. Uh, we better get over there, Kowski. Uh, yeah. All right, all right, all right, folks. Step back. Step back. Now, let's clear the field now. Back inside the waiting room, all of you. The fire boys already have it licked. Yeah. yeah it looks like a ghost lying there. Well, what do we do now, Sergeant? Yeah? Poke around a bit. It's safe now. I have to make a report on this. CAB boys will take over in the morning, but I got to make a report anyways. Well, exactly what are you looking for? Uh, bomb fragments, maybe. Maybe a hunk of the container the bomb was in. Who knows? Oh, this is some mess. What's this? Hmm? Well, let's see. Hmm. Could be a bomb fragment. If you see any more, don't handle them. Prince. Print? You mean Prince would stay on after an explosion like that? Yeah. Crazy, ain't it? Uh, step aside for a minute. What? What? Hmm. Another fragment, just like the other. And this one is embedded in a piece of leather. Yellow pigskin leather. Uh-huh. Figure the bomb was in this bag? Maybe. Maybe not, but it's something to go on. Now, let's go talk to the passengers. The pass... Why would a passenger put a bomb in his own luggage if he knew he was going to be blown to kingdom come? Nice guy, whoever did it. All right, folks. All right, settle down. You've got a little talking to do. Everybody here that was to be a passenger in Flight 63? Uh, officer, my name is Stephen Bradley. So? We're badly shaken up. Some of us need medical care. You have no right to hold us here. Only the right to find out who tried to murder 40 people. All right, Randy, I'll handle this. Well, then it was murder. I knew it. Now, now, take it easy, folks, and you'll all be out of here in a few minutes. I said quiet, everyone. Now, we'll call you up one by one. All you have to do is tell us if this piece of yellow leather pigskin was part of your luggage. There's enough of it here to identify. Okay, Bradley, you're in a hurry. We'll start with you. Thirty-six potential corpses lined up and filed past the piece of yellow leather. None of them claimed it. Then Sergeant Kalski checked their addresses and gave them the routine spiel about being available for further questioning, and he let them go. Well, not much more I can do. Tomorrow the Aeronautics Bureau will take over. I'll phone my report in. Uh, my watch, right? It's just quarter to ten. Yeah, it's right. Uh, you coming back to town with me? Well, if it's okay with you, I'll stick around here and do a little checking on my own. Okay. Uh, but I tell you what. If anything hot comes up, call me at home. Don't phone it into headquarters. I don't want them to think oh, you know... Oh, perish the thought. Kowski gave me his home phone number and left. A little prodding and the baggage man remembered seeing the yellow pigskin suitcase. And then came the first big break. The baggage man found a delivery slip from the Minerva Messenger Service testifying to the fact that they delivered in good order one pigskin leather suitcase to be checked on the ticket of one of the passengers, Mr. Stephen Bradley. I found Bradley at his hotel. He hadn't checked in yet. Then I called Sergeant Kowski. There was no real welcome in his voice. So glad you called, Randy. Got the thing all wrapped up? No, no, but I, uh, I found out who owned that yellow bag. Stephen Bradley, one of the passengers. Yeah, I remember him. I'll go out and pick him up. No, it's not going to be that easy. He's not at the address he gave us. I'll get him, all right. So that's who it was, huh? I'll have him by midnight. Uh, what time is it now? It's, uh, 25 to 11. Where will you be? At the Minerva Messenger Company... 24-hour service. Never heard of it. You will. 
The brakes were with us. The Minerva Messenger Company had a complete record of the pickup on the suitcase. They'd found an envelope in the mail slot that evening with two dollar bills and a key in it, and the typewritten unsigned note had instructed them to pick up a suitcase in the locker at the Arlington bus depot and take it to the airport to be checked on Stephen Bradley's ticket. It was nearly 11 o'clock when I got to the bus station. And near a row of long, unboothed telephones, there was a candy and cigar stand. Yes, sir. Something for you? Uh, those are the only pay phones here? Uh-huh. No closed booths. When it's quiet, you should know some of the conversations I listen to. I guess you make change for a lot of them, huh? Yeah, it drives me nuts. My boss don't like me talking to men during working hours. Well, uh, I'm disqualified. I'm a reporter. Reporter? No kidding. Yeah, no kidding. I'm trying to locate a woman who phoned me from here. She's about, uh, oh, about 20 to 9. Were you working then? Yeah. Yeah, what'd she look like? I don't know. I don't know. She'd been crying. I'd say she was in her early 30s, uh, kind of a sexy voice. 20 to 9? You say she was crying? Well, toward the end of the conversation, she started crying. I think I know who you mean. I talked to her. Now go on. She came in about 15 minutes after 8, maybe 20 after. She looked scared, like she'd run away from somebody, so I watched her. That's my slow time. You said you'd talk to her. She asked me if anyone had left a note for Mrs. Curran or Curran. Some name like that. Oh, Mrs. Hal Curran. That's what it was. You think she was Mrs. Curran? I know it. She said if anybody asked for her that she'd be back. A few minutes later, she made the call. It must have been to you. She burst out crying and hung up. What did she look like? Like I wished I looked. Dark hair, five foot three or four. Beautiful figure. No wonder you're looking for her. Uh, she was alone? Nobody with her that I know of. And she got on the bus all alone. You wouldn't happen to know what bus? Sure, the Lake Forest bus. She asked me what time it left, and I told her. Say, that should make it a cinch. Her name is Mrs. Hal Coran, and she lives in Lake Forest. Well, that's almost too easy. It looks like she loaded you with information, knowing that I'd be around. In a way. Maybe I don't blame her. Now, what's your name? Marion. Why? Well, if this story breaks, I'll share my byline with you. I don't know exactly what you mean, but I'm all for it. I was looking for a Mrs. Hal Coran. The girl who'd phoned me from the bus station to so accurately prophesy the bomb explosion on the Denver-bound plane. And she left a trail easy enough for a tenderfoot Boy Scout to follow. In less than an hour, I was pounding on her door. Is that you, Hal? Open the door, please. Who is it? Let me in. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Oh. What do you want? I'm Randy Stone, Mrs. Coran. I don't know you. Please, get out oh, of here. Oh, you called me earlier this evening at the Chicago Star, remember? Oh, you're, you're mistaken. Mrs. Coran, you warned me that a bomb would explode in the Denver-bound plane. Well, it did. What plane? I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, uh, let's face it. You're not very good at this sort of thing, Mrs. Coran. You gave yourself away half a dozen times. First, you made your phone call from a bus depot. I found out which one it was by tracing the baggage back to the Arlington. That's where you call from. You're, you're crazy. I, I wasn't out of the apartment all day. Then you walked up to a bright young girl at the candy counter and asked her if there was any messages for a Mrs. Hal Coran. I talked to that girl. She described you to a T. Want some more? You, you have no right to talk to me like this. I'm just trying to refresh your memory. You took the Lake Forest bus, correct? No! You could have made it easier if you wanted me to find you, and I think you did. Oh, I, I never thought of it. Stupid, stupid. Stupid. You wanted me to stop that plane and get to the person responsible, didn't you? I tried to stop him. I begged Hal not to do it, but he was like a crazy man. Uh, your husband, he engineered this little thing? Poor Hal. Poor mixed up Hal. Well, give me a description of him. We've got to have him picked up. No, it's too late, I tell you. He said he was going to, to take his own life after the bomb went off. NBC is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. This month of September, many thousands of children will be going back to school. Four times daily, these children will be walking to and from school. You are urged to be careful, to be watchful, to be safe. 
In one year's time, 61,000 children were killed or injured by motor vehicles. Watch for children darting out from that blind spot between parked cars. Watch for them as they get on and off school buses. Watch for children playing on the sidewalks and crossing the streets going to and from school. Remember this. A child may dare, so drive with care. And now back to Night Beat and Randy Stone. I got his description and phoned it into police headquarters. I asked him if Sergeant Kalski had brought in Bradley, and they told me he hadn't. All the while I've been on the phone, Mrs. Coran sat there crying. Sergeant, if you locate Kalski, tell him I'm at... Uh, what's the number here, Mrs. Coran? Uh, Evergreen 31074. It's Evergreen 31074. Thank you. He's dead. It's my fault. It's just like I did it. Well, there's no point in blaming yourself, Mrs. Coran. It, it was the quarrel. Hal and Bradley had started the business together. They were equal partners. Mrs. Coran, I'm a reporter. Maybe you'd better not say anything. No, it, just like I killed him, I've got to talk to someone. He may not be dead. About, about six years ago, Hal gambled with company funds. Bradley found out and said he'd prosecute if the money wasn't returned. Where could Hal raise $6,000? Oh, that's quite a mound of greenbacks. They, they made a deal. Bradley was to get Hal's interest and agreed to keep Hal on as one of the shop foremen. After that, he lost all his initiative. He stayed a laborer in a business he'd created. I begged him to break away, but he wouldn't. We quarreled about it often. I, I didn't know it would lead to this. Maybe you better try and have a rest. Last night, Hal came home from work... I'd never seen him look so old and beaten. Helen? Just a minute. Hiya, honey. Hi. How come you brought all your things home from the office? Well, let's not talk about it now. I'm dead. Hal, something's wrong. Not now. After supper, please. Oh, it's always not now with you, isn't it? Tell me, Hal. All right. I lost my job. How to work, canned. Lost your job? Hell. I'll get another one. Bradley fired you? Why? It wasn't Bradley. It was the new people. What new people? Why is it you never start from the beginning? What new people? Bradley sold him the business. They didn't want me, so I'm through. Bradley sold out? That business is half yours, Hal. We've been over that before. Oh, without a fight, you let him sell out without opening your mouth. What kind of a man are you? What was I supposed to do? Hit him over the head? No, that takes nerve. He's a dirty, rotten... And he didn't say anything to you till it was all over, huh? Oh, he came up this morning and said goodbye. He's going to the coast to live tomorrow night. To the coast to... With your money. And you just stood there and said, good luck, Bradley. Oh, Hal, this is the last straw. I can't go on living with a man who won't fight back. Spineless, incompetent. Oh, that's enough of that. Shall I kill him? Is, is that what you want? You kill. You, you coward. I'm no coward, Ellen. And I'll prove it to you. I'm going out now. Hal, come back. What are you going to do? What do you want? Kill Bradley. Kill Steve Bradley. Oh, who said anything about killing? Just go up to him and demand what's coming to you. That's not what you really want, is it, Ellen? Oh, try talking sense, Hal. I'm talking it for the first time in my life. Hal! Come back, Hal! And this was last night? I didn't know he meant it, but... This morning, he brought it home. He had a gun, too. He said he'd, he'd kill me if I tried to interfere. He was crazy. What did he do with the bomb? He put it in the suitcase and made me go with him to the bus depot. He put the suitcase in the locker. Later, he had a messenger pick up the key and check the bag through to the plane. But why a bomb? Why, why take the lives of 40 people to murder one I man? I told you, he lost his mind. He wouldn't talk to me all day. He just watched me every minute. And after the messenger came? He said goodbye to me. He said as soon as Bradley was dead, he'd kill himself. Well, we've got to find him. When he finds out Bradley wasn't killed, he'll go gunning for him. Br Bradley isn't dead? 
But the bomb, you said it went off. Well, it did, but the plane was still on the ground. Your call was in time after all. Then... Then nobody was killed. <laughs> well, what's the matter? Don't you understand? Nobody was killed. Nobody. Al... Al killed himself for nothing. Poor Al. Even this last thing couldn't come off right for him. Well, I'm not so sure he's dead, Mrs. Coran. He may have been at the airport when the bomb went off. He may be looking for Bradley now. And with a gun. He's dead, I tell you. He's killed himself. The outburst tapered down and Mrs. Coran fell back exhausted on the couch. I called the police again. Still no news. Neither Bradley nor Coran had been located. Mrs. Coran had fallen asleep and I sat opposite her and waited. I heard someone opening the door and I turned around. He stood there in the doorway. An old, old man in his early 30s. His shoulders sagged and there was a look of utter dejection about him. And he blinked stupidly at me and then he walked slowly over to the woman on the couch. What's the matter with her? Ellen. No, let her alone. Let her alone. She's exhausted. You're Hal Coran. I got to talk to her. Ellen, mm. wake up. Oh. oh, what do you want? It's me, Hal. Hal. Hal, you, you didn't... I couldn't do it. I couldn't go through with it. Oh, oh, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Ellen, what's the matter with you? She's hysterical. That's what's the matter with her. <laughs> Poor kid, it's my doings. Ellen, baby. Get away from me. Don't touch me. I hate you. Ellen, listen. I'm arresting you, Mr. Coran. A citizen's arrest. Me? What for? Well, just to remind you, the bomb in Bradley's suitcase. If that plane hadn't been grounded and your wife hadn't called me, you... What are you talking about? I, I couldn't go through with it. Do you understand? I I was going to, but like Ellen says, I, I got no guts. When it, when it comes to a pinch, I got no oh, guts. Oh, Hal, lying won't do you any good. Haven't you even got the strength to admit what you've done? I took it out of the locker and brought it home early this afternoon. But... You were out, Ellen. I, I disconnected the fuse and I put it in this drawer. That's the truth. Right in here. Come here, mister. I'll show you. Uh, well? It was here. I put it here myself. Oh, it's funny. Honest, it's funny. The mess he makes of things. I'm phoning the police to come and get you, Coran. Put that phone down. Oh, give me that gun, Coran. I mean it. I, I put the bomb in that drawer. Somebody took it out. A gun, please. Hal, what's the use? Helen, somebody took the bomb out of the drawer. Coran. Stay put, mister. I'm, I'm leaving. How long do you think you'll last? Long enough. And don't try to follow me. I phoned the cops again and brought them up to date, and then I went looking for him. I figured he might be hiding close by. In a few minutes, the neighborhood was swarming with police, so I went back to stay with Mrs. Coran. I heard some movement behind her door. I was sure it was Coran. I wanted to get in quietly so that I could grab him from behind. A man was standing near Mrs. Coran when I got inside, but it wasn't her husband. Bradley. What? Oh, Mr. Stone. Oh, did, did no. you... No, no, we haven't got him yet. It won't be long, though. This is the newspaper man you told me about, Ellen? Yes. Where you've been keeping yourself, Bradley. A lot of uniformed men have been looking for you. Oh, he, he knew at the airport that Hal had put the bomb there, didn't you, Steve? Yes, I recognized the leather. I'd given that bag to him for a birthday present. Why didn't you tell the sergeant? I wanted to square it my own way. I tried to stop it. I tried all I could. You tried all oh. right. Hal! I locked the door. Line up against the wall, all of you. Give me that gun, Coran. Get back. I'll shoot you. I mean it. Well, the cops will be here in a minute. That's all I need. A minute. Hal, D darling... Put the gun down. We can settle this without guns, Coran. It came to me all of a sudden. A few minutes ago, I got the total. I did take that bomb oh, home. Oh, he's lying. He never came home all day. So I asked myself, who put it back in the suitcase and had it delivered? 
The answer was so simple, I had to laugh. Ellen, she took it back. Lee, Lee. Coran, you're not on trial here. Save your defense for the right place. I'd suggest that you... Don't move. Anybody tries to stop me now gets killed. Why bring Ellen into this? Why don't you be man enough to take it I up? asked myself that, too. Why would Isn't Ellen... Isn't anybody going to stop him? Then it hit me. Ellen been working me up on Bradley. Not because he was running out on me, but on her. Get it? He, he's crazy. When I told her Bradley was leaving, I, I couldn't understand why she went wild like that. Then I started remembering little things, like useless trips Bradley would send me on, stuff like walking into a room and seeing him laughing about something. You know that special kind of laugh? Hal, you're being ridiculous. Poor Hal. When he showed he was going to run out on her, she... She wanted him dead. And she took the bomb out of the drawer, rigged it up again, and sent it to the airport. You see the way it added up? Lies. Every word of it lies. You prove all that in court and you're in good shape, Hal. I can't wait for the court to straighten my accounts. I just got the total tonight and I got to pay it off. Steve, he's going to kill you. Now, look, you're not yourself. What do you want? Money? I'll give you some. Lots. Steve will make it right with you, Hal. He will. Tonight, tonight I got the picture. Bradley, Ellen, and Hal. Ellen, Bradley, and Hal. Hal always laughed. No, 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 that's not true. You know when it all came to me? After I left you a little while ago, Ellen. I didn't go running through the streets looking for a place to hide. I went to the apartment house next door. I sat down on the fire escape. Open up in there. Keep quiet, all of you. Know what room I could see from the fire escape? This one, Ellen. I saw Bradley come in. Hal, you... Oh, Hal, honest. It, it didn't mean anything. You ran up to him, and I saw a look on your face, the same look I used to see when we were first married. Randy! Randy, you in there? Hold it. Koski's got a gun. Shut up. You took that look away from me and gave it to Bradley. That made it a clean sweep for him. My business, my job, my wife. Hell, I'll make it right. Just give me a chance. You, Bradley? You don't owe me anything. It's Ellen. What she's taken from me, there's only one way to square. Me? Oh. How are you... You're going to kill me? Coran, listen. I believe you. The court will, too. You love me, Hal. Don't you love me? Yes, Helen. I love you. Then you wouldn't... Coran. <laughs> Goodbye, Helen. He did it. He killed her. Yeah. Yes, I was in the middle of that one. Now I've got to write it up for tomorrow morning's eye-opener. Now, whose point of view will I handle it from? Hal's? You couldn't do that. He's a murderer. You wouldn't want to sympathize with him. And Bradley's? What's he done that a million other men haven't? And Ellen? That reminds me of the song, Please Don't Talk About Me When I'm Gone. Now we better leave Ellen out of this, too. How about a nice bit on the grain exhibit at the museum? Hmm? Copy, boy. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. This transcribed story was a Lewis and Russoff script with music by Robert Armbruster. The part of Ellen was played by Joan Banks. Others featured were John Stevenson, Paul Fries, Stan Waxman, and Sandra Gould. Frank Lovejoy appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of The Miracle of Our Lady of Fatima.
Listen next week at this time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. Nightbeat came to you from Hollywood. Protect yourself, your savings, your very way of life by becoming an investor in America. Buy new, improved United States defense bonds regularly. Yes, buying defense bonds is the way you can directly contribute to America's security and your own. And it's so easy to save the defense bond way. Just join your payroll savings plan where you work, or if you're self-employed, sign up for the bond-a-month plan where you bank. This way, you automatically put aside as much money as you want to each month. Before you know it, you have a backlog for emergencies, savings for a trip, the down payment on that new home, as well as having helped Uncle Sam in the all-important job of defense. And defense bonds are now an even better investment than ever, with new improved interest rates and a quicker return on your money. So become an investor in America today. Buy more defense bonds more often because they're now even better. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. That's Nightbeat, with the bomb on Flight 63, starring Frank Lovejoy from September 4th, 1952. Also in the cast, Lovejoy's real-life wife, Joan Banks, Paul Fries, and Sandra Gould, as originally heard over NBC. Next time on the Film Detective Podcast, Raymond Burr stars as Lee Quince, Captain of the Cavalry on Fort Laramie from 1956, so don't miss it. To learn more about this series, visit thefilmdetective.com. See you next time.